introduced and remain standing for a moment of silence. Make everybody aware that the town manager is here on Zoom, uh, as is Council Vice President Jeff Keel. And I'll say Happy St. Patrick's Day. We'll start with a review of the minutes from March 3rd, 2022. Is there a motion to adopt? I make a motion to adopt the minutes. Second. Any discussion, any changes? All those in favor say aye. 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 Move into the citizens forum. I'll let the town clerk read the public comment statement. Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting and we welcome your participation. By attending, you acknowledge that this session is recorded during the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. The scheduled agenda is available on the information table just outside. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The town council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely. And in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we'll refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from the public would like to provide comment? All right. Yes, sir. I sh yeah, I think probably uh, Mike in the middle of the room, or you can come up here and sit down, just state your name and maybe your address. My name is Joe Brown. I live at 122 Concerto. I see on the agenda tonight we have the uh, Carter Farm uh, discussion here. I just want to say that I went to that hearing or whatever you call it um, on Sunday and I was a little bit disappointed in what happened there. I think the, uh, and I went to the one up at Vincent Street some time ago, I don't even know when it was, last year sometime that uh, they made a presentation. But on Sunday, the place was so crowded, um, there was no presentation made when I was there, and they only had two people to answer questions, and there were lots of displays. I could have asked a lot of questions, but uh, it was just a madhouse, so it really didn't give us a good forum to get information. Uh, compare that to the last developer who held it on the site and had a lot of people there where we had plenty of opportunity to ask questions. So I don't know why they only had two people, but um, it, it made it difficult to really get details on what's going on. And I, I compared the drawings, you know, I couldn't tell everything that was going on. I could tell they made some changes, but anyway, it, it could have been um, uh, better handled, I think. So anyway, I don't know how many other citizens felt that way, but my wife and I definitely felt and decided it wasn't worth our time to stay around there because it was so, it was getting very crowded actually, which was a good thing to have people there, but um, we came to get information that was difficult to get anybody to talk to. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Anyone else on the list? All right, we'll uh, move on to appearances. Carol D'Agostino with the Main Street update. Carol, good evening. Hey, I wanted to give you an update on some of the projects that I'm working on. Primarily, um, I have a um, $9,000 uh, grant from uh, Maryland Main Street and uh, Housing and Community Development, and Main Street throws 2000 in it, so the project itself is uh, uh, 11000 and what it pays for is uh, some direct services to our businesses. One would be 
um, a workshop, um, and the workshop will be held April 25th in this room. Um, and uh, we've chosen Monday because a lot of our businesses are closed on Mondays, so it would be a good time to capture them. And it's going to be a lunchtime meeting uh, called Succeeding in the New Normal. Uh, so what we want to try to do is um, kind of infuse the information to our businesses that they're going to need. We saw a lot of businesses doing a whole lot of things that they probably never thought that they would do in 2020 to stay uh, vibrant and open. And I need to try to uh, capture that enthusiasm and that uh, momentum to take risks because I think that's what's going to be needed to move forward and not only to have our businesses recover we keep hearing about recover I want them to thrive so uh, we're pulling together a group um, it's going to be uh, moderated by uh, Dale Walls who's a high-performance business coach and uh, we brought together two other panelists uh, Megan McDonald who is Vice President of Marketing at Hello Alice, which is a national firm. She's going to travel from Pennsylvania for this. And uh, the portal Hello Alice is a machine learning portal that brings together all the resources that a business would need as a launch and also to expand. So there's uh, I, at least three days a week I get uh, things about grants and funding, for instance. Uh, it also captures about 300,000 entrepreneurs across the country who can then mentor folks. So I think that would be an awesome resource for our businesses to know about. And our third uh, panelist is Kimberly Prescott. She's the founder and president of Prescott HR. As you know, staffing is a huge issue. Uh, so they're going to come in and kind of uh, share what they have been hearing from folks and also uh, lend some insights and advice on uh, what our businesses really need to focus on because we're seeing folks do things simply because they see other businesses do it. There's no silver bullet and we really need to get people to understand that. But if we can uh, give them some viable information on what they should be paying attention to, then they can make the best decisions for their businesses. And another really awesome part of this grant is then we're going to be able to give away free technical services. So, for instance, uh, Dale will be uh, providing uh, business coaching sessions. Uh, Kimberly Prescott will be providing one-hour HR sessions. Um, I will be buying um, blocks of time from folks. In addition to those two folks, we have a um, digital media specialist, Rockfish Media, who's going to be providing um, Social Media 101 and website audits. They're based in Easton, right? Yes. And uh, a videographer and photographer, Caroline Phillips, who is from Centerville and now lives on Kent Island. Um, she's going to parcel off some photography and videography services. And uh, graphic designer, Christina Lippincott, who is our paid contractor for the circular, who's going to be able to provide some graphic design services. And what will happen is a business will fill out a form, provide uh, a first um, choice and a second choice. Uh, if things go as we think it will, we'll have uh, 26 sessions of one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, to provide to our businesses. So get them thinking on the right path and also provide them direct services so they'll be able to work directly with these um, with these consultants, so that's a it's a great first step. I think um, I'm still determined to squeeze out a little extra money to do um, a separate workshop for our restaurants because I think they have some unique uh, issues and and uh, work with the Maryland Restaurant Association to do that. Um, so that's that grant. Uh, everything needs to be finished by the end of July, so I think we'll be right on target with that. Um, and I wanted to give you a quick update on the Wayfinding Signage Grant. So uh, the contractor has uh, taken our comments, put them back into the plan. Uh, I now have that. Oh, uh, Carol and I are going to get together next week and review everything. But the plan actually calls for a total of 44 vehicular signs 
and 11 pedestrian signs. So there'll be in total 41 locations and a total of 55 signs. So we're, we're staying on top of that. And something that I haven't reported on lately, but it's pretty cool to sort of take these benchmarks, our uh, community gift card program that we launched back in December of 2020. I pulled the stats for that and it's pretty awesome. So uh, during the course from that point to now, uh, there have been $19,230 of transactions. So that's the total number of, of gift cards that were purchased and uh, $14,942 of those have been uh, um, used already. This is a program that doesn't cost the town a dime, doesn't really cost the business money except for uh, they pay for a card not present transaction. So they're paying you know, about half a percent more in their merchant's fees. But we were able to encourage nearly $20,000 of additional transactions and sales from our businesses. So it's pretty cool. It's wonderful. Yep. And that's all I have. Council, have any questions? Quick question. So the um, gift cards that have not been used but are out right now, is uh -huh. there a expiration on those? So no? you have to try really hard to make it expire. So what it is is a rolling 12 months. So say you got it in December, but you haven't used it and it's now March. You go to the creamery and you buy a sandwich. Your 12 months starts now. So whatever's left on it. And every time you use it, the 12 month clock starts over again. So you have to try really hard to make it expire. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we also have $8,000 left of bonus card money on that. And that was from our micro grant program. So we're looking to roll out another bonus card program around Mother's Day. So we should be transacting some more sales for our businesses. And Carol, while you're sitting up here, I shared yes. this with Carol um, directly um, this past week, but I've been talking to some local businesses and just saying when we think of events like Drink Maryland, Centerville Day, First Friday, Fourth of July, what would you have us do different or better? And I highlighted with Carol that several businesses, not one, several went on record as saying that we need to keep her doing what she's doing. And one said, don't, don't change that role. So I just want to make sure that you were acknowledged publicly for that. I think that's pretty cool. Well, what I, what I, I second that motion. <laughs> yeah, because you're the one that would have to say, I get it, Carol. I, I'm on to you. Um, but I, um, I, I think the thing that I, I love the events, however, I love things that show that we're pushing in and helping our businesses make more sales. And I think that's the key part of Main Street that sometimes people forget. Um, but yes, the events are great as well because the events will increase foot traffic and uh, potential new customers that will come by and, and sell and buy. Awesome. Okay. Well, I think you're doing wonderful work. I think this program is doing wonderful things. and. I'm always impressed when you come in here and tell us what, what's cranking. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Kip, would you like to introduce Samantha? <laughs> Surprise! She didn't know she was signing up for this. Yes. <laughs> this is Samantha Smith. Um, she started with us two weeks ago, yesterday, or Tuesday. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, she is an administrative um, assistant for the Public Works Department, and she has done a great job in taking a load off of me, both her and Janelle. So um, they're doing great. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my name is Samantha. I'm rounding out my third week here in um, the Department of Public Works. Um, I don't know. I have my undergrad in music. I have lots of experience in um, sales and assistant, um, administrative assistant. Um, and yeah, I'm very excited to be part of the team. I'm really excited to come on board. So You're thank from you nearby? Me. I'm sorry? Are you from nearby? Yeah, I'm from Denton. Okay. I'm living okay. in downtown Denton now. Nice. Good. So well, move to Centerville. Well, <laughs> we're glad to have you. Yeah, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Easiest time Kip's ever had up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's not later. done yet. <laughs> <laughs> he's not 
not done yet. We will move into some old business, starting with uh, Liberty Commerce Street's construction assessment. Councilperson Johnson. Good evening, everyone. And for the folks at home and, and the folks in the room, um, some of you have seen a document, and I am embarrassed that I don't have the date on it, but I know it was done after the, the Liberty Commerce Street project was completed that Steve Walls put together, our previous town manager. Um, it's an eight-page document, very detailed, very well assembled. Um, so I want to highlight that first. Um, and so two things. One, as part of my campaign promise, when I, when I ran, I said I wanted to do an additional independent assessment. And regardless of whether that was a campaign promise I wanted to keep, I have continued now that I'm elected, as I'm sure some of my fellow council members have heard, run into folks in our citizenry that have concerns about well, what did we learn from that and, and what are we doing differently now to make sure that we don't repeat some of these uh, things that happened that, that contributed to the cost overrun, et cetera. So I do have some slides uh, that I can flip through. Hopefully I'm doing this right. Maybe not. Thanks for the presentation. <laughs> Thorough. Did you turn the TV off? I bet I did. I think he may have turned it. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, so for those in the room, you have a, um, a paper copy, and this looks very lengthy. I promise I'm not going to read every line, but what I am going to ask is uh, if Carolyn Brinkley, our town clerk, um, sometime in the next day or two would share the PDF version, the, the Word document, and the slides um, so that folks that are dialed in from home can, can have the luxury of all this fun reading. Um, at any rate, in my days in the Air Force, a lot of... Um, after action reports, um, critical incident reports, you know, planes go down, things like that. We would do an after action lessons learned document. And the document that I fell in love with over the years was an SBAR. So a document with four sections, situation, background, assessment, and recommendations. So what I did was I've spent since October of last year through this month, and thanks to several people who are in the room here today, additional detail as recently as three hours ago. So for those of you that saw me come in, a minute or two late, uh, had some issues with the slides, but I, I just can't say thank you enough to our town staff uh, for, for really stepping up and providing some detail very late in the game here. So I conducted interviews in the last six months. I, as I mentioned, the document that Steve Walls put together uh, worked on several of the data points in there and incorporated those. Um, and then there was some academic information that I was able to find online to kind of back up some of the assertions that are made. So, the situation, and I'm going to summarize each section. So, we know that in 2018 and 19, the town completed a water sewer line replacement along Commerce and Liberty Streets. Um, and this was done as a unit bid price contract, uh, which followed what was a 2016 Kidwell Avenue project which, in my opinion, you know, was a sensible uh, decision. Uh, the total project cost for the town was $8.6 million as opposed to $3.7 million that was originally projected. And I think that's the bullet to put a fine point on that clearly our citizenry has concerns about how did it, how did it reach such a, a different number. And I think this, this document will help kind of articulate that, but more importantly, this will outline some things that I think that we can do. And these are not all my ideas. These are things that we as a council and members of our community have suggested that could be helpful. So I want to make sure it's clear up front that the recommendations at the end, I can't take credit for all of that. So um, the town used a series of options to cover the difference between the estimated and final costs. As you all know, we had a special election to decide on use of the emergency fund. Uh, the council unanimously authorized the use of $1 million from the general fund, then an additional $250,000 um, and up to $2.55 million of investment emergency funding based on the vote from our citizenry being in favor of that. And then as of 2022, uh, $2.619 million was withdrawn from the investment and emergency fund for the Commerce Street Liberty Street project, also referred on this document as CLS. So, as I kind of said, there, there's still this lingering perception among our electorate that this project was, and I'm using terms that I've heard, mismanaged, that future projects are at risk. And so, I'm hoping that this assessment, combined with the things that we can do moving forward, will help reassure our citizenry that we have some good things in place, um, that there was more than just Jeff Morgan, Tim McCluskey, and Jim Beecham, excuse me, 
who were involved in what was really a hundred year project, and in my opinion, nightmare in the making, literally a century. It will cover that. So uh, we do have a lot of significant infrastructure projects on the immediate horizon, so I think it's really critical that we ensure our voter trust. So moving on to background. That might be why. There we, there we go. go. <laughs> Just want to thank our QAC TV folks for the uh, assist there. Class At class of 94, <laughs> that would be my class. Clearly, I didn't do as well as uh, Ted McNeil. At any rate, uh, background. So, this is where that 100 years comes into play. So, it was in 2000, excuse me, 1913, we had terracotta water sewer utilities that were installed along Commerce and Liberty Street. Uh, additions were made to these. Uh, 1913 lines around the 1940s, um, and there was no replacement until 2018. So again, 1913 to 2018, we're talking over 100 years. Uh, countless leak repairs were performed during this 105 year duration. Um, I've shared my story that I grew up on Chesterfield Avenue, and I remember seeing every single day, it seemed our public works folks digging in the ground, we're patching something, and I remember stupidly asking, do we have a river under Chesterfield Avenue and these other streets in town? And they said, no, it's just our infrastructure is so old. So that was decades ago, and folks on the street even said, gosh, we really need to replace this. So um, in 2003 to 2004, um, I'm not going to read through all these bullets, but you can see there on Section 2D, the town undertook a Maryland State Highway Administration, or SHA, master planning program. There was a citizens group that came together, and here was our opportunity to potentially get um, some state funding for this. The bottom line in all of that was that because we had not replaced the infrastructure, the state made an assessment that this would be a, a poor investment because we're going to go back in and we're going to make these repairs and then have to pay to have the resurfacing and milling done completely again. So as you see in D7 there, the project was unfunded due to that anticipated constant repairs of what at that time was a 90-year-old water sewer infrastructure. So fast forward to April 2017, the council authorized the staff to begin uh, the utility placement project, the fact finding, et cetera. This is probably one of the most critical findings that I really don't think the public understands, and that is that the State Highway Administration, District 2, had come into the town and basically said, we want to begin Commerce Liberty Street milling and resurfacing in July of 2018. If the SHA project proceeded, then the utility replacement would be deferred for 15 years, so 2033. Well, you can do the math. If we wait from 1913 to 2033, we're really in trouble. So the town did push back at that time, and so uh, the SHA was agreeable to defer the milling and overlay project to the summer of 2019. Uh, for the project. This one-year State Highway Associate Administration project delay provided a very narrow window for the Commerce excuse me, Liberty Street project. No time for bids, and that's critical to note because I come in contact with a lot of folks that were like, why wasn't it bid? It really should have been bid, and I think as we continue here, you'll see why. So my assessment, I should have gone forward. Sorry about that. Um, my assessment is that the anticipated costs uh, were multifactorial. We did have one significant adding error, and this is probably one of the most significant bullets on here. Um, and this I ascertained through interviews of multiple staff. The original project estimate was for one street versus two. The original estimate was for one street rather than two. So the project was Liberty and Commerce. The, the original estimate, I don't know from what I have here whether it was for Liberty and then we didn't factor in commerce, commerce or we did, had an estimate for, for commerce and didn't factor in liberty. But that has been identified, and so that's, that's significant. Um, unexpected State Highway Administration requirements. Um, the asphalt sub-base is normally three to four inches. After we had already priced this out and the town uh, folks were already working on this and our contractors, the State Highway uh, Administration came in and said, no, we want 12 inches. So there was an additional uh, price increase that was unexpected. The constricted timeline prevented full engineering studies, and then of course we discovered major issues at the south end of Commerce Street that also jacked up the price. And again, I said there was no time to bid, so the full set specifications and standards for contractors utilized was not in order. So the assessment, and I'm gonna to try to talk fast because I know we have a lot to cover tonight. 
The sewer lines were constructed of terracotta, so what's worth noting in the assessment is that they, these have a life expectancy of 50 to 60 years only. If you Google that, I found 30 different sources that said that, but I did find one, one to quote, but that's, that's pretty much everybody knows that. So based on that life expectancy, the pipe should have been replaced between 1963 and 73. So I personally am not here to attack any of the previous town councils, but for those that want to pin the challenge of this on folks in the last 10 to 20 years, I just draw your attention to the fact that we really should have been looking at this in 63-73. Uh, one good thing was that no translate asbestos cement pipes were identified during the 2018-19 roads project. That could have created a host of other issues. So um, just worth noting. And then this is the part that I just really want to drive home because we have a desire in our community, not unlike anybody else right now, especially with post-pandemic economics, nobody wants our taxes to go up. Everybody would like us to reduce them. And yet we're faced with all these infrastructure decisions. So <laughs> what I want to draw your attention to quickly is our tax rates were reduced from 2002 to 2020 over the same period in which our population more than doubled. In 2002, the council approved a 48 cent tax rate, and this rate was continuously lowered until 2010. Now, do I think that was bad of these folks to do that? Not necessarily. Looking back and seeing, and you're gonna see a chart in a minute that perfectly illustrates this, our population's increasing, our tax rates going down. So the opportunity for a council to make some decisions on, let's set aside you know, 100 grand a year so that we can at some point in the next 10 years uh, replace the infrastructure. That was not afforded. So, I apologize, let me get my place. Um, so the, from 9, 2009 to 15, the tax rate remained at a decades long low of, of 38 cents. 1910 to 20, um, the population went from 1435 to 5379, which is almost four times. And the tax rate was kept flat and lowered from 2002 to 20, and during this time, of course, the infrastructure replacement remained unfunded. I'm gonna to advance to the next slide just to illustrate. I have been promising Chip, our, our town manager and our town staff this slide because this is so helpful as we identify requirements for our departments, for the town, emergency situations, you name it, to be able to show that the blue section is our population from 1990 to 2022. So, we quadrupled in size over this time frame. The red line that you see is our tax rate over that same time. So we saw an increase between 1993 and uh, around, around 2000, a sharp drop in 2002, and then you see where our tax rate was rel relatively flat uh, through to 2020. So again, not here to criticize what was done, but if you're sitting out there wondering why this was not paid for prior to this point, I'm not seeing any numbers that suggest that there was an easy or logical window in which to do that. So just my assessment. So just finishing up this section, um, it's, it's important to note in looking at the Department of Public Works that throughout this time, so again, I wanna go back, throughout this time, the Department of Public Works staffing was pretty flat. So in spite of our infrastructure increasing in size, the scope and magnitude of all the things that needed to be managed, the opportunity for public works to pull an employee out to say, I need you to full-time manage the road project was not really an option. So this assessment continued, and then I'm almost done here. Um, so the town requested an independent review of the CLS project the objective for that was that this reveal whether the project was reasonable, provided good value. The document that I have, our previous town manager completed Steve Walls, and so what you see that follows here, and I'm just gonna summarize these, is we went out, we as a town, and asked two nationally ranked firms. Uh, one was KCI Technologies, and the other was Rommel, Klepper, and Call, RK and K as they're known. I, I put references in this Word document to their websites. You can see that Steve didn't assert that they were nationally recognized. Untruthfully, they were. So the comparison of the costs, our project's actual expense was 8.147 million. That's without the engineering fears and, and inspection. When we asked these two firms to take the actual amount of materials used and to go through a process, sorry, go through a process 
of mapping out what this would have cost, how long it would have taken had we gone through bid, and these are the numbers that came up. So for KCI, their total cost would have been $8.41 million, and RK and K would have been $13 million. So from a value standpoint, getting what we paid for, these estimates suggest that we did get good value. However, the formula to get there is, is where we had the challenge. Engineering costs, we had a total of 107000 compared with KCI estimating 640000 and RK and K350. Uh, inspection costs, the town's actual expense was 94000 compared with KCI's estimate of 243, RK and K125. Uh, and so the comparison of the actual versus protracted bid projected, bid projected timelines the town's project's actual duration was 18 months, 1.5 years. KCI's projected duration would have been 39 months. Clearly did not work for the state highway folks saying you have a year delay and then we're going to come in and do this. And then finally, RK and K had a duration of 31.1. So one good thing that's the last bullet here is that the 1819 Commerce Liberty Street project completion now positions us for Centerville to do a streetscape planning and funding initiative that we could not do when that opportunity came up before. So the recommendations, oops. There we go. Um, this is some of the stuff that we've already been working on. And so as I go through these, I'll just say which ones I think we're already doing or we're in the process of doing. So the first one would be to ensure appropriate staffing levels commensurate with the size and scope of the infrastructure and population. I think our town manager at present, our clerk, all of our department heads are working very closely together and truly understand the expectation in our community that we gotta get things right and right size things in a way that we can avoid a situation like this happening again. We have a new project manager in the Department of Public Works. She's here in the audience tonight and is evidence of our commitment toward that end. We need to carefully consider state and other agency driven projects that prevent the use of a bid process. So if a state agency, federal agency comes in and says, Centerville, we really want you to do this. And if you do it, we'll delay our thing by a year. We might not want to go through this again. And so I think with this in our rear view mirror, we know that we understand that. Um, the third thing, implement capital investment planning processes that extend well beyond five years that we currently look at. So for example, 20 to 50 years out. Obviously, the cone of uncertainty greatens as you go out, but if we have figures that suggest certain parts, certain widgets in our plants have a 20-year life, we can start to map that out so that we can ideally have a good capital investment plan over the next several de decades with a co-commitment of keeping our tax rate flat, if not be in a position to lower it. Uh, we need to revisit that capital investment planning regularly to allow for that proactive uh, capital planning and maintain those tax rates. We need to consider organizing and maintaining a budget advisory committee. Several of our citizens, one in the room this evening, has asked if that's something that we could bring back that uh, Councilman uh, Beecham had uh, instituted and maintained for a number of years. But that's a group that could potentially review significant capital projects for an additional check. Uh, F, work diligently to reduce the town debt and increase the value of the investment in emergency fund. We are in the process of doing that. We've received some great proposals on managing our debt, decreasing that debt, and continuing to improve and increase the value of the investment in emergency fund. G, aggressively communicate these lessons learned and completed recommendations with the electorate. As I said at the outset, you know, I would really like to see the Word document here, the PDF of that, and the slides sent out, Carolyn, if you're able to do that. So anybody watching from home that says, I had a real hard time listening to you, which doesn't hurt my feelings. <laughs> this was long and I appreciate your indulgence, but if you wanna look at this on your own time, we'll get that out. Finally, consider council application for streetscape planning and funding with citizen involvement. Um, you'll see a series of end notes here. This shows for anything you wonder where did that information come from, you'll see where council minutes were quoted, um, interviews, etc. And so after all of that, that's the presentation. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate you putting all that work in, Eric. That's really helpful. It was a lot yeah. of fun. Your idea of fun and mine are different, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you again to the staff, Kip, Karen, Carolyn. Um, I'm probably forgetting folks, but, but just thank you, thank you, thank you. There's uh, next on the agenda a discussion about a moratorium on new water and sewer 
allocations. Council has a memorandum from Council Member Johnson in their packets. I'm going to turn it over to you to lead the discussion. Eric, do you think we could talk about wastewater treatment expansion real quick? Yes. As a lead in. So, a legislative session ends in about three weeks. They are expected to be two, maybe three more supplemental budgets, so we're not without chances to get state funding for it. But I think we have to be maybe more aggressive in our approach. Um, I looked up and saw that the county commissioners have a retained registered lobbyist. I think perhaps we should reach out to the county commissioners and ask if we could borrow an hour of his time. He's an extremely powerful Annapolis lobbyist that they have to reach out to the governor's office and try to get our request moved. The revenue estimates in Annapolis continue to come in with a huge surplus. They did just pass the gas tax holiday, so that eats up a significant amount of resources. But I think um, we'd be fools to not be as aggressive as possible. And if the county has a lobbyist that they're already retained and are using, it's beneficial to the county for us to have adequate infrastructure also as they go through their comp plan discussions. I just think we, we need to direct the town manager to reach out to the county administrator and see if we can make that happen. I also think um, we need just good old grassroots advocacy from citizens too to reach out to our delegation and any other contacts that they have in the General Assembly to say, you know, we could really use funding for this important project. I think it's no secret that this is probably our best shot of a year at getting the money when there's a ton of federal resources in Annapolis. We have a Republican governor who has a demonstrated commitment to the shore. I just think we got three weeks left to try to get this money, two or three supplemental budgets. I would like consensus from the council to direct Chip to reach out to Todd Moan and try to make, get some movement from their lobbyist. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. Okay. Councilperson Keel. You can't figure out how to unmute. You're on mute. You can thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. <laughs> so let the record show we have five on board for that suggestion. And folks, there's a reason, obviously, there's a lot of lobbyists out there. And there's a reason that people that use them tend to get information. And, and if, if at a minimum, if we can get a status that here's your chances, here's what's available. So thank you, Ashley, for in, uh, yeah. injecting that. So the memo that you have before you that I'll draw council's attention to and um, to the extent that there are copies for folks. Um, we put together, um, so I want to again thank the town staff, um, had a session with uh, our town manager, Department of Public Works leadership, um, our town attorney, our new town uh, DPW project manager, and our admin assistant in that area. Hopefully I didn't forget anybody. Uh, but what we did was we put together this concept and just to remind everybody that may not have been here at our last meeting the concern that we further identified last time and have continued to highlight as a council is the idea that we are very near if not have exceeded the maximum capacity percentage that we should have for our wastewater treatment uh, in terms of the edus those unit values so when we know that we have uh, wonderful projects like Carter Farm, um, other projects in the wings, developers asking us the feasibility of putting XYZ in the business park. We as a council, of course, felt like we needed to be honest brokers and, and basically consider, which is what the discussion is intended to do tonight, a timeout, if you will, on EDU allocation so that we are not in a position where we are offering things that in good faith may not be there. The greatest concern that we've put on the table up to this point is the idea that not only are we near capacity, but the wastewater treatment facility that we have is dangerously close, if not past a point where it could fail. And clearly that would be our next Liberty Water Street, uh, or excuse me, Liberty Commerce Street project. So we're not, we're not looking to that. So that being said, what is proposed here, as you see in the memo, is that we implement, consider implementing an immediate moratorium on the allocation of new water sewer EDUs pending the implementation of what would be facility replacement and ideally the acquisition of additional EDU capacity. So as you see here, we talk about what we really don't want to do um, in terms of maintaining good faith with our potential developers. Um, and so while while we are waiting the replacement um, considerations that Ashley um, just mentioned and the funding that we could get, um, we, we, we really do need to consider waiting. So the, the timeline that you see here, and I wanna make sure we spend a minute on this, is that this would go into effect once we're able to approve it as a council. So after we go through the hearing and all of that, 
um, and it would continue through January 31st, 2023. For our developers in the room and even you know members of the council, if you're wondering, oh my gosh, why would we wait that long when we continue to hear, and, and Chip, I'm gonna defer to you in a moment to speak to any update that you guys may have or Kip uh, on the particular project funding cycle. But what we anticipate up to the point of our last meeting was that we would probably hear something in October. So the thought of this group of staff and myself was if in October we find out that the grant awards have been delayed by three months, four months, we're going to have a, a problem where we're not able to then have a hearing and do all these things. So January 31st, 2023 is not a desired date. That is a sort of no later than date based on what may or may not happen with the grant. So that being said, Chip, if you don't mind, would you just jump in and is there anything new to update us on before I go through the rest of this? So first off, I, I am thrilled to hear about the lobbyist and I'll reach out to Todd tomorrow to see if we can secure that time. Um, the timeline we have now is that in May, I think I mentioned this in the last session, in May there will be the initial draft scoring of the applications. In July, the final scoring of the applications and then with funds available sometime in October. Now, what we have ascertained from MDE in our interactions with them is they will fund updating from the, the basic um, denitrification up to the enhanced, so from ENR to BNR. That would mean they will pay to upgrade our entire plant with the existing capacity as is. And then there's an algorithm that they'll use to say, okay, of the expansion to a million gallons per day, we will cover X. Now, as, as Councilman Kaiser pointed out, there's monies out there within uh, the, 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 the state funds that we're going to reach out to hopefully as lobbyists to try and get. And to remind everybody, Council did write to the legislature back in January saying that, hey, you have asked development to move toward the infrastructure that exists a lot of cases not just in centerville but in others that infrastructure is already taxed so if you want us to do this we're amenable to it but we need your help i went to a webinar last uh last week on the bipartisan infrastructure law that can at the federal level for the epa and maryland got about 143 million dollars out of this um and looking at their criteria from EPA, we qualify for these funds within the state revolving funds. Um, so that when Eric mentions the capital investment plan, in addition to water wastewater plants upgrade, there's another $10 million worth of infrastructure needs within the town. Not all as dire as the wastewater treatment plant, but eventually as Eric's uh, report just demonstrated, if we continue to push these things off, they're not gonna be like fine wine. They're not gonna improve with age. It's just going to get worse and deteriorate. So there are options to look at, but by October, we should have an idea of what the grant will yield and then what we'll need. So we're going to have to jump on the horse on this and move as aggressively as we can. Um, so again, it's, it's something we need to keep an eye on as we consider implementing this and then as we you know work toward uh, involving a lobbyist to advocate on our behalf and at least get information um, that, that flows nicely with us potentially implementing this uh, as we consider the additional points here that I'm going to go through. So um, I talked about the timeline, the preservation of the current commitments. This is probably most important to those out there that um, have paid either fully 25% uh, in some cases. And then in cases where we have vacant lots, we do uh, charge a vacant lot fee. So I'll just run through those quickly. Uh, we do have a handout that reflects in detail which specific uh, companies, uh, individuals, etc., actually have these current commitments. But the summary of that is that we have 62 residential EDUs, 10 fully paid, four paid at 25%, and 48 vacant lots without deposits but with paid vacant lot fees. Additionally, 68 commercial EDUs, of which 22 are fully paid, 44 are paid at 25%, and two vacant lots without deposits but with uh, paid vacant lot fees. Um, I should note that since this document and the topic being on our agenda has been made public, um, we have had uh, one particular entity, uh, the Carter Farm Project folks, um, that believe, based on some traffic, that, that they have a commitment that, that needs to at least be factored into the discussion. 
and, and from the vantage point of let's make sure we're at least talking about it and looking at it, I, I would uh, concur with that. Uh, the net EDU capacity, so after subtracting the commitments that I mentioned above, the 62 residential, the 68 commercial, our remaining EDU capacity during the moratorium period would be 195 EDUs. Uh, part of this per, um, moratorium would ensure that folks with these EDU commitments could modify them uh, within the current numerical value, but they could not be increased. So for example, unless we do anything different with Carter Farm, Turpin Farm, Turpin Farm, excuse me, those two properties, just as an example, each already have a residential EDU, one EDU for their existing structures, the homes that, that are on both of those properties. So um, processing of applications, um, the suggestion from the staff is that the moratorium would apply to receiving, processing, or approving any application, site plans, subdivision plats, um, building permits that involve additional EDU allocations. Um, a matter of discussion that has evolved since we put this together was a suggestion that as applications come in for EDUs that we at least date time stamp those so that they can be placed in order, the order in which they've been received. And so the point at which we are ready to terminate the moratorium, we would be in a position to consider those in the order in which they were received fairly. Um, so that's what we've put on the table. Um, and as you see attached is the additional level of, of detail that you see. I mean, I know this is gonna take a lot of discussion. I agree with what you just said, Eric, though, that we should continue to receive and and process applications and put them in a queue. I think it would be silly not to. I think we'd have a deluge to deal with uh, when we can turn it back on, when we have a better idea about wastewater treatment. Um, we have to do something, in my opinion. I'm not sure after conversations, particularly with Carter Farm, that I still think a total moratorium of non-paid is right. I'd also wanna know from the attorney, this last part where the moratorium would not apply to governmental functions. Why, why would the, go the government get to scoop any other developer? I, I would be disinclined to provide allocation to a governmental entity if we're not providing it to anyone else outside of an emergency application that I think during a moratorium we should have some sort of emergency process. So just, I'm disin the county's got a ton of unused allocation. Who else is it where? So I'm, I'm gonna ask um, Kip and or Chip to comment further, but what I will say is we have um, projects like the jail, the detention center expansion, and depending on where that is, I, I'm not sure if that's kind of what we're thinking. Kip, you might well, For me, I can just say I would be disinclined to give the detention center any allocation if we're also not considering giving any business people allocation. I, I, I think that's, that's a fair I just think assertion. a moratorium's a moratorium. We, if we need a bigger jail, then maybe a moratorium's not the right move. I, I just, I hesitate to say we would give the government something that we're not willing to sell in the free marketplace. I can tell you that, uh, with doing the research uh, to help you come up with this moratorium language, we did check with the county to see what their rough schedule is for, for building an application and everything. Um, so uh, the time we would they would actually apply for a building permit is after the moratorium deadline by several months. Okay. So, so we wouldn't have to have that necessarily that provision the the only thing that provision uh and i can't speak for the attorney uh but uh i think the only reason that it was put in there is if something was to happen uh let's take we don't get the the money we're expecting to get or hoping to get to finance the the thing and the, uh the wastewater treatment plant and this pushes this process out further than the January 31st deadline. Um, it gives you a little bit of leeway. Say this moratorium goes on another six months, 12 months past that. Um, you know, I, and again, I can't speak for the attorney, so I don't know if uh, that just gives you some latitude that you may be able to do that. Okay, I mean, that makes sense to me, I guess, conceptually. I'm only one person up here, but like I said, I would be disinclined to give allocation to the government that we wouldn't sell in the free marketplace. I think that'd and be silly. I, I think and the one reason we were thinking about the detention centers, I think they have state regulations that are requiring them to do this expansion. And the state should definitely fund our wastewater treatment plant. 
Exactly. <laughs> you understand. <laughs> Maybe the jail should join us, Department of Corrections should join us in our advocacy for an upgraded wastewater treatment plan if that's what it's going to take to get them a bigger jail. Well, and on that note, if we're going to tap potentially the county's lobbyist, then they're not just asking questions that help us, they're asking for questions, you know, that, that are going to help the county. And I mean, the county's a significant change. landowner inside the town. Yeah. yeah. So this uh, memo in front of us here says that the moratorium would apply to receiving, processing, or approving any applications. Right. I'm saying we should change that okay. and put applications in the queue so that anyone who's been working on something now also just, there are on the list, you know, plenty of paid for or at least partially paid for EDU. So I think that covers a lot of what's sort of in the pipeline right now. Business Park has some EDU available, that sort of thing, but just to make sure that whatever we do is thoughtful, because the moratorium is a very serious choice to make. And while I agree that we have to do something, I think I hesitate on the full moratorium after you know additional conversations over the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Just and another thing, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the, uh, the, because of the, that drove the suggestion of taking them and putting them in the queue by your water and sewer allocation policy. That's how it has to be done. We have to take them in the order that they are, uh, that they come in. Now, there are plenty of stipulations and everything that they have to meet to apply for. They can't just apply for allocations and not have an approved plan, a totally approved site plan. So they have hurdles to get to before they can even apply but uh, I do agree with the, the fact that we put them in the queue but do not act on them yeah. until the moratorium then we can do the investigation so if somebody puts a, an application in uh, let's say November 1st and the moratorium deadline is June 31st I mean January 31st February 1st we start going through it if their application doesn't meet all the needs of it, that application goes back and it's no longer first in the queue. Exactly. Until it comes in, everything's approved, all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. So. It's, and I think it's safe to assume for, for folks in the audience and, and those dialing from home, this is not something that this, I hope I'm speaking for everybody when I say this is not something that we are excited to do. Um, exactly. we're, we're up against the wall and we're, we're, we're here to make tough decisions and so if you don't mind helping to put a fine point on it based on as this indicates that if we honor the commitments of the 68 commercial and 62 residential and we're left with 195 EDUs what percentage are we at and what are the implications if we continue <coughs> at the, the time that that, that was done uh, uh, January of 22 just a few months ago um, we're at 87 percent so you said 87 yes and if you look at uh the following page and you have to understand when i say 87 percent the way that you figure this is on the um uh, uh the daily average for the year for the past three years and you total them together uh, do an average from that. So at an average from the past three years, it puts us at 87% of our capacity. Uh, the other thing that's in this sheet that I'm speaking of, it shows you the flows, and that's what we're figuring our capacity on. It's not necessarily count need to use for this person or this account and count need to use for that. These are actual flow numbers. Um, you know, that's where the increase is coming from. And what? It, how many gallons, remind me, is each EDU? 200 okay. gallons a day. Is that comparable to other towns or other towns? It, yes. Okay. It's, some of them are higher, some of them are lower. Uh, the state picks 250 gallons per day. But if the municipality or system can show that they consistently use a different number than the 250 then you can use that to calculate your flow okay. and that was long before i was here uh centerville was able to prove that 
they had they were only used to 250 gallons, I mean 200 gallons a day rather than the 250 gallons a day. And then this is just really because I'm curious, do we track or have awareness of like businesses that require multiple EDU for whatever reason their type? Do we keep track that they're not regularly going over that EDU? And then what's our process if we have an existing business that say bought three EDUs and they're actually using five? Yeah, we go back and evaluate that. Um, the we way did, we, we did not, we did that for GTI, the, the correct. previous council. Uh, GTI, I'm trying to think of some others. There's several of them. So if we uh, had a moratorium and, and we found there's like a repeat offender of overusing EDU, what would our ability to charge them for additional EDU be during a moratorium? I see that as they're already using it. So, you know. That's figured in the flow capacity. We would just want to make sure, in my opinion, that that's super clear that we can sell additional EDU if it's to mitigate against overuse. Yeah, and yeah. you're actually back or back charging for what they've already used, so it's not like they're taking more capacity up already. I mean, they right now I understand that since we're going based on flows, correct. I just want to make sure that if the moratorium was written to say we couldn't allocate EDU that in that unique situation to mitigate against overuse mm -hmm. we could. Yeah. When, uh, when a project comes in and, and they get their approval and they apply for their allocations, uh, we look at how they've applied for, we follow MD guidelines for figuring how many EDUs that particular project uh, will require and that's what we go by. Um, you know, there are cases like the, the YMCA, we've been talking back and forth with them, and we've used historical data from other YMCAs that, uh, to help us equate it. But uh, from that point, from the day that that uh, service comes online, we will look at it for one year, and that gives us all four seasons of use, plus we see how close we are to what was actually figured. And it can work both ways. It, there can be things like GTI was using far more than what was calculated to begin with. And we spoke with them, met with them, showed them the data and everything, and they agreed and they came up with the extra allocation money. And it was, we phased it in, they had some time to pay for it. Yes, so the, right. yes, the, the town understands that that can be a large, you know, uh, and in their case, it was a bit of funding. So, so we just need yes. to preserve that process, in my opinion. Yeah. So I, I, I think this is a, a solution in search of a problem. Uh, this <laughs> moratorium. And I've thought about it for a long time, really, ever since the idea came up. Um, all these sort of qualifications that we're making up here, all of which make sense, we we already have the discretion to make those calls. This is the council decision to make allocations. So I think we're really sort of taking our prerogative away to make decisions based on these last 195 EDUs on whatever type of use might come up. Right? I mean, there could be some, there could be um, maybe a hotel that comes up and we've all talked about how badly we need that. Um, so, you know, I, I just, I feel like it's the council's responsibility to make these decisions on a case by case basis after the application, after they've gone through that process that you talked about, you know, and I think there's, a, a, while no mem no town manager, no council person, past, current, future, can make a commitment of allocations. So if a developer is going to say, in, in my opinion, we have a commitment for allocations, or the allocations are there, that is frankly immaterial, in my view, mm -hmm. because only three people sitting at this dais can make that decision. Correct. Mm -hmm. Now, are the EDUs available? Based on what I've got in front of me, they are, yeah, they are available. Absolutely. So I think it's a decision we need to make in real time based on the information based on planning commission approval recommendation, that whole process, and we get the, you know, these things to come to us and we make a decision on them, then we either we don't have the allocations or we do, or we don't like your project and we're not gonna give them to you for that reason. Mm -hmm. But it, this is really, in my opinion, sort of 
uh, neutering the, the authority of the council for the next eight months. And, you know, I'll also say I'm concerned about the, the momentum, right, the expectation of a developer that if, and I don't know how you deal with this, it's a problem without an obvious solution, that you're in sort of in process for a long time, right? And I, I do wonder about if we're, if we're moving forward with the planning, you know, and Councilperson Kaiser did say we ought to change this, so I'm reacting on what I, what I have in front of me here and have had in front of me for a little while, is if we are moving forward with applications while we have this moratorium, you know, I do think there is going to be a certain amount of momentum in the favor of the developer when, okay, the moratorium is lifted, I've gone through all this process, where's the allocation? I just feel like this is a decision that council should continue to make the way it always has. Um, and I would also note for council, you know, there's, there's, there could be a delta between what the state is willing to pay for and what, you know, this thing costs, this expansion Absolutely. costs. So my understanding is the state has agreed to pay for pretty much everything associated with the update of the current plant. So five, 550,000 gallons per day to upgrade that to ENR standard. Mm -hmm. Anything above that, there's still some question about what they're going to pay for. Mm -hmm. Well, there's $14,000 roughly of connection fees at Carter Farm. That's $1.8 million. Mm -hmm. that's, what that is, that's what that funding is for. Literally, that is what that funding is for, is to invest in the system. So I just would ask us, look, I don't want to be held hostage, but I think that's actually the, the worst thing municipalities can do is to go out, and you see this in TRAP, it's, it, is, it is a longitudinal experiment in TRAP right now. Ridgely is the same way. Of saying we're going to expand to meet a developer's needs. I understand that. But we have two infill properties. We're not talking about annexation to infill properties that are going to be developed. It's just a, quite, you know, a matter of when. Mm -hmm. And I think there's also an issue of, of the town re, sort of re, having a good reputation, uh, having a straightforward reputation. Mm -hmm. and, and I do think we've seen this in other issues where we've sort of implied things to stakeholders, you know, we've implied the allocations will convey. I forget exactly that issue that was down on. Uh, oh, down on um, the end of Windsor Avenue. That's right. That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And where you know there's kind of you can convey, you can't convey, and then we, because of a, because of a, of a town official's commitment down there, you know. So I just this needs to be a place where people feel like they can do business and get a fair shake. Here, here. I, yeah. The one thing that I would encourage council to do, if you haven't already, look at your water and sewer allocation policy, read it and understand it, and let me know if you have questions, because that will also help you with your decisions as well. So. And I, I want to say, you know, thank you to Councilmember Johnson and the staff for putting this together, because it was helpful to me to reflect mm -hmm. on this document over the last several days, and thinking about this, and really thinking about what issues. Like you said, Councilmember Klein, like all the things that we would want to put in as qualifiers that make moratorium just seem scarier than, yeah. <laughs> than maybe it felt originally. And so, you know, I agree that the council should retain its power here and just be really, really thoughtful about how we use our remaining allocation. And then also, I just think we have to be clear to anyone who's interested in building in the town that we need their help getting this thing funded. I mean. In addition to the fees, which are not enough overall, in addition to, you know, advocacy to get it funded by state dollars, I just think we all have to be, this has to be a sort of we're in this together, the wastewater treatment plant could fail. And You and, say fees, you mean connection fees? Yeah, I mean connection fees. I'm saying, yeah, no, the water bills are enough. The connection <laughs> fees are, are, while they do generate substantial income, it's not going to be the connection fees that we have in the foreseeable is not enough to fund that delta between the upgrade and the expanded capacity that we want. But I think for this council, for consistency's sake, you know, we send a letter to the county in their comprehensive plan process saying, you know, please make sure that annexation into Centerville is part of, you know, things happening at the 301 213 interchange. We can't then throw our hands up and say, but hey, we have no allocation to give, so <laughs> you just can't develop at all. And so I think 
we have to be really, really aggressive. I just I can't stress that enough. We have to be really aggressive about making something happen for this wastewater treatment plant. And the, and I'll just I'll just sort of build off that and say, similar to the tax issue over time, especially the last kind of two decades, where we have gotten into not investing, and you know you sort of see now the position that that puts us in, right? Which is anything that's all new at one time is going to be all old at one time. And the, the utility fees, yes, they, I agree they are high. I'm not, I don't know that they're high enough. Um, we need to be able to cover the bills and the operation of the plant and invest as well in, you know, and that's the connection fees. But forever and ever, I think the public needs to be aware of this, uh, forever and a day, uh, the council made the decision to take from those connection fees and fund the operation of the system to, to, to depreciate a capital asset and use it to fund the operation of the system. Yep. And this council and pre future councils, I hope, will commit to not doing that. Mm -hmm. Right. So this, while the connection fee may not be enough, you know, uh, it's certainly not enough to pay for the system and the improvements and keep utility rates low. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is this. There's been a lot of financial mismanagement. It's not just this, you know, this uh, roads project. It's it's, you know, keeping taxes low and not spending any money has been a priority in this town for so long. And now you get to see the cost of a you know a pound of the cure because the penny wasn't invested in the prevention. Right. If I might just very quickly respond and say, uh, again, as Ashley indicated, thank you to the staff for helping to put this together. Um, we, of course, were doing our homework from the last meeting, so I want to just say for the record, I am emotionally unattached to <laughs> moving forward with this, and I, I, I truly agree with the, uh, the sentiments um, that have been raised. What I would just offer as a suggestion that if, if we have consensus on um, I like your suggestion, Kip, that we take time to read the water sewer allocation policy, and if that's something that we could maybe get emailed out so we're not hunting for it, that'd be great. Um, and then I think it's just critically important that at each of our upcoming meetings, and to the extent, so this is really a question for you, that it's not a, um, a true horrendous burden on you and your team. Can we run just-in-time capacity percentage utilization reports in a way that we know how close to, to the limit we are at, on a regular basis and also to Ashley's point that we identify those scenarios where somebody might be using less and so we actually have more capacity than we thought or they're using more and, yeah. and we need to be mindful of that. Um, like I said, the, the capacity is taken from the actual flow numbers. Okay. So uh, that's not going to change the capacity if somebody's using less okay. because we're using actual flow numbers to calculate it. Uh, we do still check, you know, like I say, uh, we do keep an eye on it. Uh, in the past, I can say that that wasn't done very diligently. Okay. Uh, but I can tell you in the past few years, uh, we've been staying on top of it. So, um, but, you know, we're here to do as you wish. So that's all. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, Before you go any further, so let's say we go to a million gallon per day plant, which is the plan, and we we have, let's just say we continue at the current capacity that we're at now, so 400,000 gallons a day or whatever the number is. Does the cost to operate the plant go up if the flows don't go up? Um, with the type of plant that we have, yes. The, the, the operation of plant's going to go up some, but uh, we are able to use segments of the plant until we get to that capacity, if you can understand that. Sure. Uh, because so it, build, the, it builds up to its... Right. In other words, we won't run 100% of the plant unless we're up to 100. I, I shouldn't say 100. We're not going to run 100% of the plant if we're only treating 50% of what it'll do. Any other questions for Kim? Yeah, you, I interrupted you. You were about to say something else, I think. Um, oh, with uh, staying up on 
to update this, uh, our flow and the capacity management and everything. Uh, we add the figures in there. We try to do it once a month. Uh, we take the month's flow data from the wastewater plant. Now it's a month behind because uh, from the time that all of our uh, testing analysis and everything comes in, it's a month later before we actually have all the numbers to be able to put into it. But we do stay up on it month to month. So I, you're, you're good. I was just going to say, I appreciate you kept providing us easy to understand information because I certainly did not grow up thinking I want to be involved in the management of a wastewater treatment plant someday. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm just <Yes>. really incredibly <laughs> helpful. <laughs> I just really appreciate that you make it easy to understand. I really feel strongly that if people at home are not understanding or are curious about the, the flows or where we're at for capacity, that you have an administrative assistant now and they should totally reach out <laughs> to get additional understanding because yeah. you have made it really easy for me to understand at least and so I appreciate the service that you provide. Here, here. And just a little funny humor for you on that <laughs> part of us that. operating the wastewater. Um, there was uh, studies done a few years back on wastewater uh, treatment plant operators, supervisors, and that kind of stuff. And uh, the survey was done to see how many of them actually chose that career path. <laughs> and the funny part was the percentage was very, very low that chose that career path, but the percentage of them that stayed with it was very, very high. So, you know, it's in the industry, it's a funny thing. Not too many people look to be a wastewater treatment plant operator, but when they do, a lot of them do stay. <laughs> so in, in, in which percentage did you find yourself? <laughs> I can tell you, I definitely, this was not the this career was path that I chose, it chose me. So. Okay. We're grateful that you fall on that, but I chose to stay. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Very grateful. Yep. Your career is in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and my wife has a, a million of those jokes that I can't share <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. We are going to turn now to a Carter Farm public forum update. Rebecca? Okay here? Where do you, where you can do whatever you like. You can be there, or there's a stand-up. Um, if you have a routine, you got to do that too. <laughs> and you have to be. You know, are you going to see my microphone? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because they can't hear you at home if you're not. That's what I'm. Uh, that's what I'm assuming. So, um, great. Well, thank you all for um, allowing me to come here because we we did have a really great turnout, and I apologize. To if he didn't feel his questions were able to be answered. Uh, quite honestly, it, it, there was a big rush at the beginning, and then it was a pretty much steady flow through the day, but all total, we had about 77 people show up. And as a result, I think that it was great that I can share with you what we learned, uh, and I think we're still learning from it. And so I think, first of all, the library ended up being a really good location and doing it on Sunday seemed to be a really good location, I think, for most folks because not everyone gets to be off on Sundays, but a um, fair number do. I have to make sure I remember which one I'm advancing. So to just um, let folks know, that, that worked out great. We actually sent out 1,700 postcards and we used a mail and print service and so we were sort of, I know some things came to addresses with the wrong name or whatever, we were using that service, but I think for the most part, that seemed to be how people found out about this. I did, I did get as much of a tally as I could on that. Um, I hand delivered around town, which was kind of fun, because I got to talk to some of the merchants and people and, and uh, you know, get it on public posting boards and whatnot. And then the town email blast um, coming in afterwards, I think really worked well, because I think people saw it in the postcard and then they got the email blast. And then, of course, word of mouth. So we did have 77 people attend, which I thought was really good. I had told myself, managing expectations, I would be happy if we had 60 there. Um, and then there were a lot of people that didn't sign in. So I, I think we could have even, you know, it could have topped out more than that even. And based on the sign-in sheets, the addresses that I scanned down through, really 98% were all from Centerville. And so I think that was great. The materials that we did have in the room included not only a two-page fact sheet, summary sheet, which is on our webinar, which is on our website. Then we had this give, give us your thoughts questionnaire, which I'm going to share with you in terms of some of the outcomes of that. 
and information posters. It was sort of like an information session around the room um, where people could sort of go to each topic area, read about it, and then you know learn and go around the room. And so some people were only interested in certain topic areas, and then we try, tried to cover what was there. And then the setup was, like I said, I, I really enjoyed using the library large meeting room. They were happy too. They said they got a lot of new customers. So cost, just so you know, because I was at Planning Commission last night, and they were thinking, well, maybe this is something we need to do on a regular basis. Just to share with you, um, I totaled it up. It's about $2,100 in terms of mailings, printing, refreshments, everything, to just give you a ballpark of what this type of an event might, might take in the future. Um, whoops, wrong one, okay. So this score sheet that we put together, of the 77 or so, basically about a third of the people chose to actually um, return this. You can kind of see it on there, it's a two page. Um, basically it was a double sided sheet when people signed in, we asked them to please, um, please, you know, fill it out. And I will scan, but I think I'll take off names just for people's privacy. Uh, but I'll scan all of those. I have entered verbatim everything into a multi-tab spreadsheet. So, that was, so I have all of the data, and you're going to see a little bit of that. Um, and then we said, tell us more. I'm going to share some of that with you. And then only seven of those actually left their email on those forms to say, yes, please follow up. We have some questions, which I'm going to be personally doing that. Um, and then we have all the sign-in sheets, too, which I'm happy to scan and share with the town. In terms of the reading to here, basically what we tried to do was organize, organize around these topic areas, just to give you a sense of that in terms of, and those actually, here's my tally, um, which I am going to walk through with you by topic area. And I'm going to move as fast as Eric did earlier just to give you a glimpse, and then you will have the, the PDF of this, too, so you can go back and look at it. But uh, fortunately, I like doing um, spreadsheets, so it all has been tallied by topic and gives you a sense of where we were at. The why, why we organized around those topics has really been what we've been about since the beginning, which was going back to the 2016 community conversations and those particular topic areas that came up during that, that point in time. And so, and then we built on those with other things that we've heard about and things that we cared about uh, as, as developers also in terms of particularly conservation. So, and the scores are, now I'm, I'm gonna say very, very clearly, uh, this is not a scientific data set at all. It just gives you an idea. And, but I think very importantly are the comments. So on these sheets, basically some people chose to fill in comments and some didn't, some just went through. What I was trying to do in doing this, it was a quick way of people to just say, you know, bam, 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 what they wanted, but if they wanted to say more, they could. And then we had a section on the back where they could say even more. And so you get a sense, actually, through this, out of, out of five, five being the highest, I just kind of went through and did that. But you get a sense of some of the comments. I'm not gonna read them all. You can see some and you'll get the PDF, so I wanna just keep this rolling for you all. So that was on community priorities. You'll also see at the top of every slide my color coding. If it's an orange slide, it's the slide I've added about the comment page versus this slide, which was the actual poster that was at, at, the, at, the, uh, at the event. So that poster was there, and then people could comment on the poster about honoring history. And so in this case, you see some of the, the questions, comments that came up. It, this, this came up a lot. I want to thank Rachel Carter, who actually is also in the photo, who was there actually working with us and just wonderful, a lot of the day, um, helping to answer questions also, and that was, that was just a huge help um, to us to have her there, because she knew some of the people arriving, and so that, that was really fun. Um, the next one, in terms of about living at Carter Farm, these are just some of the data points we put into the poster that are very real, up to date. In fact, what the public saw is actually more up to date than what you all have last seen because we've continued to update as we get comments and feedback from the staff in the most recent TAC review that we just had. So on this one, this is the average score. You can see that you know a lot of people were really excited about some of the features around energy and water. Um, negative comments, I did not editorialize anything. Everything here is verbatim. Um, Interesting thing on this is the question of rentals have come up both ways. Some people ask, there's not going to be any rentals. Other people ask, well, will there be rentals? 
or that will ask about price points and our response to the price is we have a general idea, but until we get through approvals and the time frames and everything required, we can't pin that down exactly. I think um, rentals was the first question I asked you when we met. Yeah. On the positive so, side, I think we need more rental units. I think, I think that's the case with most communities around here I, I'm seeing, and so I can understand why, and it actually creates a, you know, kind of a, a, a pipeline uh, into people into home ownership. Um, so farming was the next category area. These were just, once again, some of the features that we have been talking about for some time. Uh, you know, this, this was not one person. This was three separate people saying, love, love, love. So there was a lot of love in the room that day. Um, and, you know, these are just some of the comments. I'm just going to keep going here. But, you know, it's just, I find it fascinating. I do these kinds of things for 30 years, and it's always interesting. Uh, to see what you get. And so this is about visiting. So who would be coming there? People that would be maybe coming to this commercial area, coming to the farm, coming as guests. Um, we kind of framed it that way, but then we talked very specifically and showed some of our most recent renderings on this one. That score was pretty good to the extent it's unscientific. Uh, a lot of love in the room again still. Um, you can see hopefully through some of the photos I have of what the room setup was. And I will say other than that, first rush, um, it was just a steady flow all day long. I mean, we didn't, we weren't off our feet once all day. And we were doing presentations throughout the day too. I quite frankly didn't even have time to figure out with the library how to get the projector going. So we just I gathered people around about every half hour to an hour and just said, group, if you want to come on over, we'll talk, you know, in more detail and answer questions. Connecting, this has also obviously been a big issue with, I think, um, the town, it's always been part of the conversations, so this was our connecting poster board, and then these were some of the things that came up, and I think people are really happy with how we've been able to resolve the perimeter trail. People are excited about that in terms of being able to come through the property. And so, um, you know, I think, and you'll see some comments don't quite fit the category. I'm just writing what I saw in the box. <laughs> and so that gives you an idea of that one. Experiencing nature, obviously a big part of this, what you see with the green is all the buffer area and the farm area. And so this is a very, I think someone worded it pretty well um, that I was actually talking with. They appreciate that it's a passive um, way of really experiencing the site. And, and I think there seems to be a lot of excitement about that. Um, that's not to say we don't have a bad, com I put every comment in here, bad or good, so it's not to say there weren't negative comments also, they're definitely there. Um, yeah, there, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't get the icon on, it was literally a smile face, <laughs> so I just, yeah. Um, and so, you know, not enough wide open space is the last comment, and so, you know, things were all over. Um, habitat generally has been a big goal of ours, in both in terms of the reforestation that we're doing, removal of invasives, you know, and the afforestation that we're going to be doing on this property. A lot of people that I think, not a lot, but I'd say there are a fair number that were really interested in some of these issues, um, you know, liked some of what they saw. There's other people that feel that there's a habitat there already, you know, houses are just going to hurt that habitat. You know, obviously our goal is to help improve the habitat. Um, fostering community, that's been a big part of how we're approaching our site plan. And then you can see, you know, some of these comments um, also in terms of just, it, it, they, they vary. Some people will be on one end, it's typical of the spectrum and some on the other, but these are how people feel and I totally respect how people feel. And I'm gonna be trying to follow up and go through all of the question mark ones to see if I can come up with even just a kind of a frequently asked questions type summary or something from those. Whoops. Um, we had a board on economics. Um, you've seen some of this in some of our previous materials. We've, we've updated it, we've expanded it um, to really try to continue to be, um, you know, I think proactive with what we're seeing, what we can project in terms of just using methodology of assumptions in terms of number of households, number of people in the household, size of lots. We have more spreadsheets, <laughs> happy to share with you how we get to these numbers. Um, but basically, that's what we're seeing. On this one, I think it was you know, not as much discussion. I think that's still something that people need to learn more about and we can talk more about. Um, but you can see the very on um, how people responded. And this gives you a good look at the way the room was set up too. 
with the posters around the outside, refreshment table in the middle. We had a big board of the site plan in one corner that we often would find people huddling around and we would go over and talk with folks. Some people just wanted to be left alone. Other people would come and find us because I usually pointed them out when they came in the door where to find us. Um, and then of course sewer, we couldn't help but bring up sewer since it's very much the topic these days, obviously from the last discussion. <coughs> Uh, so we wanted to at least put the information out there about what we are about. And you see underlined is our phase one. I'm not going to get into a deep discussion on that, but we wanted to sort of once again inform the public of what we know at this point. And people were really interested in this and actually just beyond Carter Farm, just I think learning or, or seeing some of this for the first time, perhaps. And so, you know, here's some questions about that. I mean, it once again, it's always been an issue. You know, can we handle growth? A bit concerning. I mean, I, I don't think it's specific in that case to Carter Farm in all cases. It's sort of a broader response. And then we had um, public approval poster, and this is the one. I tried to break down public approvals at a very high level so the public could begin to understand what this project will be going through. And you can see I highlighted um, that there will be five public hearings total, we haven't even had one yet, um, to give folks an idea of all the various layers that I believe this may be the only site in the entire town that has this many layers, um, please tell me otherwise, and then all of the reviewing agencies involved so that people at least would have an understanding of that much um, in terms of understanding how this project will move through. This is a new slide that I created, um, and I'm still working on this, but it's beginning to sort of, I think, what I found myself doing in describing to people that PUD is a three-step process. I would try to break it down, because this is my field, for people to understand and then where public hearings would occur. Two in the PUD process, two in the growth allocation process, those are the blues, and then one in the DRRA process. And so this is a new slide because I feel like I have an obligation to continue to help people understand where this, what this is, how it will work, and then there's no arrows here yet. It would get really messy if I start showing arrows on here, but I can do that, and I'm, I'm determined to do it, actually, <laughs> and talk to Sharon about um, maybe plugging those in. And so on public approval, you know, I think, once again, um, you know, it, in terms of the comments, now these are just on these sheets. Um, People that did take the time to put those in, you see a little bit there. This is my spreadsheet, my tab of all that came in on the backside, which I'm happy to, sh you'll see this. And then like I said, I can scan these because they're really interesting. I, believe it or not, enjoyed entering them because, you know, just reading and understanding where people are coming from and what I know we need to um, maybe be better about, you know, I, I think uh, communicating and what we need to understand, and I think it'll be helpful to you all also. And so, obviously, being able to read that in detail. And, and you'll send this to us. Absolutely. The efficacy in fact, it's right on now. that computer. I'll, you have it, yes. Carolyn has it. Awesome. So you can get this as soon as Carolyn has the time to send it on out to you. Um, so this was the updated site plan that we did show, and um, that was a large board in the room. This actually is the most updated version because this even reflects the TAC comments from the next step in the PUD process because we haven't been to you all on the first step yet, but we've already been moving on revisions. And so this is really up to date. It includes planning commission comments from back in December and TAC comments on the new submission that we're about to put in. And hopefully we'll be back in front of you <laughs> so we can really get you up to date on all those pieces. And so, you know, I just really want to say um, thank you to people that came. Thank you for giving me time today to just walk you through a little bit of it because these are your citizens and they did take that time. And all of these materials are also on the website. Not this one yet. I will post this one on the website also. Um, and I'll probably keep digging a little bit more, um, cross-analyzing and pulling out those frequently asked questions into some sort of a response form also. So question, I hope that was fast enough. I tried to move fast. Hopefully you got an idea of it. I'm sorry if it was too fast. Um, but any questions for me? And I just want to thank Rachel and Sandy here. Sandy was helping me. 
Um, so we did have a couple of, of helpers, um, both who have lived here um, all their lives and knew the area, and so I'm grateful to that help also. Notwithstanding uh, Joe Brown's comments, because I think it is important that, mm -hmm. that that experience happened at the beginning, I, I had the opportunity to go, and I feel like it was exceptionally well done, and um, I think taking Joe's suggestion to have some additional sessions and potentially some things on site, I know you're amenable to that. Several of us have had an opportunity to walk the farm mm -hmm. and uh, in doing so. I'm so glad that, that Rachel's here tonight. Um, those of us that had the distinct honor of knowing your father, uh, what memories. And I've actually been approached by several folks that I grew up knowing, people my age, who have said, you know, you knew Judge Carter, what would you think that he would say? And I think it says a lot that you're here tonight. And, you know, a man who dedicated his life to service and then his retirement still to service, there wasn't a young man or woman in our town that didn't swim in Judge Carter's pool. And even after he was retired, he was still, as some kids called him, Mr. Judge Carter. <laughs> and uh, I, I think it just says that I think he would be pleased at kind of where this is headed. And while we have a lot to consider and a lot of hoops to jump through, I think the slide that you presented with the flow charting was extremely helpful. And the survey that you did, we may want to plagiarize those to give to other developers to say this is what looks good. Mm. So, um, and I did want to add, we had a conversation. This I think is very important for the council and those living at uh, those at home, and especially those on Chesterfield Avenue. Um, right now, the concern that I have that is at the top of the list with this project is the fact that if you have driven on Chesterfield Avenue when the elementary school is getting out, you cannot pass, and we have dangerous passing of cars that don't want to wait because I'm not turning at the elementary school. Years ago, that route from Chesterfield past the elementary school was not one way. It's one way now that creates the bottleneck. So um, with council's endorsement, I have offered to, and Chip, I would take you with me. I have a meeting with um, Dr. Salins, the superintendent, coming up. And at that time, since I don't know the elementary school principal personally, ask for that introduction so it's not a cold call. And what I would like to do is, because this is a priority regardless of the Carter Farm Project, is just find out what can we do to address the issue of the parking congestion or the traffic congestion there. Adding this number of houses and we don't fix that, we're, we're walking into a nightmare. So um, it's something that I think there are some solutions on the table. So, and, and you've been amenable to that. So thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, and, and, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, Eric, I think the, the school traffic issue is abundant in Centerville. Where all, where all the schools are, so any you know larger conversation that the town can have with the superintendent yes. about how we can better manage traffic, maybe drop off and pick up in shifts or whatever can be done because it's a dangerous situation on Chesterfield. It's a dangerous situation on Little Kidwell. I'd imagine it's not so hot by the high school teenagers driving too. So, <laughs> thing. unrelated to Carter Farm, but related to school traffic, I think that's a larger conversation that our town police and our schools need to discuss how to better do safely. And I just want to say, Rebecca, thank you for taking the time to go through this with us, for having a community meeting, and for being available to council members too to answer questions. I just really value the time that you've put in. I want to echo what the other council members have said, and just thank you for this presentation. It's been a wealth of knowledge, and I look forward to uh, kind of diving into it deeper when it gets sent out to us um, and reaching out with any additional questions. But this has been wonderful. Great. Thank you. Please do. And anytime you want to get on the site, let me know. We're trying to, now the spring's here. Yes. It's much more fun. <laughs> before it all grows, before we're growing again. Yeah. <laughs> Great. We're good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I won't Stand take more of your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move into the FY 2023 operating and capital budget. I assume that's Karen. I think Kip's doing that. Who else yeah. would do the presentation? <laughs> <laughs> I will certainly let you. <laughs> All right, so tonight I handed everybody their binders. I wanted to give you a week to kind of review through it before we have our first work session next week. So just really quickly, the, when you open it up, your first sheet you'll see is the timeline, um, the dates of the work sessions, the times, and what building they're at. So the first one for us will start next. Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Um, here at the Liberty Building. The next two after that will be at Vincent, and the final one will be back at the Liberty Building. Hopefully four is good. If not, we usually can work other ones in if we need to. Um, tab one gives you the operating and capital budget in its entirety. The first two pages of the summary and everything else from the summary is behind it. And then the final tab um, is a supplemental tab. It's just an extra 
information, the constant yield certificates, the salary spreadsheets, the health insurance, stuff like that. Each week, um, after you make decisions um, at the next work uh, session, I'll bring new packets for you to put in different tabs to kind of see the process along the way of what changes are made. So, and that's all I have for tonight. I just wanted you to have time to start looking at it before we dive in next week if you have any questions. Is there a, um, do you have an estimate for ending that revenue for the current fiscal year? Um, I can get you one. I'll, I have, I have, I just don't want to quote it because I can't remember if it's, I can't exactly remember. Okay. In previous council. It'll be above. We're above now. It'll be above, it'll be. What we expected. Okay. Yep. In previous council budget processes, has that net operating, you know, that net revenue been part of the foregoing budget revenues? No, it usually is um, considered a fund balance. So at the end of the year, if, if there is a net, it sits in the bank and, and earns interest and isn't looked at in the future. So it's just, you'll, you're continually to have this fund balance that sits there and grows as you're working on the next budget. And then if there's deficits, it's let's take it off the table instead of, you know, looking at the, the fund balance. So does this budget expend those revenues or does it carry forward that that policy of um it doesn't expend them but it's a uh, topic of conversation that chip and i have had that we wanted to discuss with you throughout the work sessions to see what your thoughts are mm -hmm. on uses and, and what we think um would be a good total to be able to use for some of these purchases and what would be a good total to keep behind you know rainy day wise is the budget in front of us here, the general fund budget and the uh, the enterprise budget. These budgets are balanced. At the moment, no. No. Okay. But we put everything in. You said put it all in, and then we can start to dwindle away if we have to. But just so you could see where they say the needs are now, and then as we go through, that we can. And I, for one, am extremely grateful for the commitment to that. And, and I've had conversations with Chip, who's with us, of course, uh, virtually this evening. Um, it, it is great to be able to have everything in there. And then obviously we charge our town manager to, and you as our budget manager, to integrate and prioritize across the board. And so there are things that uh, don't necessarily come with your and or Chip's endorsement, but it is good for us to see those because in the spirit of what we talked about in the lessons learned for the roads project helps to be able to go back in time and say how many years have we said they need that but but not this year and if it's in the record then we can say you know what they've asked for three years in a row and maybe they're never going to get it but if it's something that we can ultimately prioritize yeah. it's good to have that additional level we'll have that record eric yeah. yes <laughs> yeah. he did, chip, down and didn't chip did go through too and so you'll see at the each at, at the end of each department tab if there was an increase we put an additional requirements explanation so you can kind of see why the increase was needed. Um, and at the end, once all department heads finished their budget, Chip sat down with me and went through and then his comments are in there as well. So we try to at least give you an idea when there was an increase, what it was for. We, we got 4.871 million in, in ARPA funds, is that right? Yep. And how much of that did we, did we budget Remind me just how much. So if with budgeted um, for projects, the project manager um, and all things, it left us, a, we still have a total of around 800,000 of funds. And that was that including could, some percentage of Sprayfield Farm purchase. <laughs> Correct. And so it, initially when it was approved, it was approved at um, a million and a half and then a loan. And then I think it was brought back to your attention like, hey, you know, you have these funds, why would you take a loan, you know? So I think that's still a discussion to instead of maybe one and a half million, two and a half million. So that would, leaving the 800,000 would account for two and a half million for a farm. Okay. Um, sorry, I've not done that yet. <laughs> Um, thank you. Just make sure you bring them to the first work session and each one will add to it so it'll be really heavy after a month. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. look forward to. Thanks, Karen. Love a good binder. <laughs> I love a good budget workshop. Yeah. <laughs>
We will move now to reports of boards and commissions. We'll start with the Maryland Municipal League. I have nothing. Economic development. I just want to highlight that our economic development manager, Paige Tillman, has given me some literature to read. I'm working on that. Um, and in accordance or consistent with what I said at our last meeting, um, the hope is, and Joe Brown's in the room as one of our uh, previous uh, CETA, Centerville Economic Development Authority, for those that don't know that acronym, um, to get together the group of folks that are still technically on that board that have not resigned, uh, left the area, et cetera, to bring that group together and kind of brainstorm a little bit on what that function can be and should be and is feasible to be moving forward. So more to come on that. Park Advisory Board? Nothing to report. Oh, yes, you do. About the county? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Well, we haven't met. You're, that's right. You're, that's right. Um, but the county put out a, a statement that they are beginning the conversation for the next budget season about putting a dog park in at, um, what is it, White, White Marsh? White Marsh Park. Park. Mm -hmm. So that is very exciting. And uh, we'll be talking at the next parks meeting about possibly writing, having a letter um, written up to show our support for that. Doesn't our ultimate trail plan connect us out there? I believe so, yes. It does, yeah. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. <laughs> it's all coming together. Coming together. <laughs> That's it for parks. <laughs> I hesitate to do this, but Council of Governments, <laughs> Council Member Keel <laughs> from a parking lot in Florida, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, the only thing I have is where uh, the text credit we're getting 13 cents again this year so that's the only thing i have really they talked about some some government money whether we're going to get it or not so we'll see uh and that's the only thing i have the uh the county still has a decision to make about or we make a request about whether that is returned to the taxpayer or whether it is we would like to keep it again is that still to yeah. be decided? Well, well, if you ask me, the way they, they already decided it for us. So I think they're going to give it back to the taxpayers again. Agree with that. But, uh, huh? I tend to agree with that yeah. assessment. Yeah. All right. right. Great. And April 12th is the <clears throat> hearing with the commissioners here. Right. And we ask for 18 cents, just so, right? We, did we, have, did we request 18 cents in? Next we, did last year. We, did, we, yeah. we didn't get the we didn't request anything this year so it remained the same it remained the same across the board for all municipalities yes standard um, uh, equation they use now and this year they actually based the so our well the 13 cent is the same, but they're basing it on assessments. So when they look at the total, even though our 13 cent is the same, the total amount is higher, and that's based on assessments. Yes. I don't have my notes here in Florida, so. <laughs> I don't have my notes, so I can't remember everything. You'll have, yes, yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Planning Commission, that's me. Um, had a good conversation yesterday, last night, about uh, growth allocations, which I think went uh, about as well as could be expected. Uh, a lot of sort of new blood on the Planning Commission, which I think is very good, and they are uh, learning a great deal about the process. And we're able to, uh, Christy Kubiak put together a very good memo on the growth allocation process. This is related for people that might not be quite aware to the critical area commission, which will have to approve any uh, change in growth allocation that Centerville requests over time. Uh, they've got a, uh, the critical area commission has a pretty good map you can look at uh, on your iPad or desktop to show, you know, where Centerville's critical area is, it tends to be, you know, kind of run with the river shoreline and the tributary shoreline. We've got, um, Areas of intensive development or IDA, uh, limited development or LDA, and resource conservation area. Uh, on the critical area map, it's yellow, green, and red. 
And so uh, this comes into play related to Carter Farm, who will have to go through this critical area growth allocation process because they are almost entirely in the critical area and currently zoned uh, LDA, that limited development area, and they are looking to, to go to intensive growth IDA. So a lot of conversation about all of that, and I believe the Planning Commission is moving forward with an April 20th uh, hearing on the Carter Farm growth allocation. April 20, 2022, that'll be the next um, Planning Commission meeting. They will have a comprehensive plan workshop on the first Wednesday of April. We, we need to get the comprehensive plan done. I think it's time to sort of empower the Planning Commission to go ahead and push through to the end of that and get it done so that the Council can start its review of that process as well. Any questions about the Planning Commission? It's exciting. Council person Johnson was there. I'd encourage everybody to come out. It is riveting. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> All right, we'll start with reports of department heads. We'll start with the town manager who's with us via Zoom, although not in Florida. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to start by thanking the Council. This has been one of the best town council sessions I've seen since being hired. Uh, more substantive conversation and more more kind of drilling down on you know one of the big elephants in the room with that wastewater treatment plant and it makes it a lot easier for staff to look at the issues when we understand where council is coming from and what it is they're trying to achieve and and what their opinions are so thank you thank you for this meeting uh, i already talked about the webinar i was going to tell you about for the um bipartisan infrastructure law so i'll move on to code enforcement, uh, we had uh, four items open in March, only one remain open, and we have one remaining open from January, three from February. So five things that Bob's working on now, uh, along with a couple other inspections that we've talked about him going out on. As far as the Carter Farm, the growth allocation had gone from um, limited area to development to intensive area development back in 2015. Carter account charter, um, that expires after four years, if not done. So we had to reach back out to um, the Critical Area Commission to make sure that they had reclassified things and acknowledged that those 40 acres were no longer accounted for. With the Critical Area um, allocations, we have about 180 acres. I think it's 186 acres for the town's use. Carter Farm is about 40. And these allocations are... Uh, project specific they don't go the carter farm doesn't automatically get 40 acres it is what is, is the project required to do that in this case it'll be 40 acres so this clears some of the technical hurdle, hurdles when the council uh, or when the town votes again to um, change or accept this new growth allocation proposal from this new effort on carter farm that everything is as it should be when we go forward to ask them for this allocation approval so we got that out of the way and pending questions, that's all I, oh, one, one question I do have. Eric championed the moratorium uh, effort and, and pulling that data together. Did council want for this lobbyist to, to meet as a group or did we want one council member to represent, to engage uh, and kind of champion this effort? I don't think we have time. We're talking three weeks left of session to, to do this by committee. I, I would offer my willingness, having been a lobbyist in Annapolis for a decade, to have that conversation if the county is willing to let us meet with Bruce, their lobbyist. Um, but I just worry that if we, we try to do this by committee, we're going to screw ourselves because there's three weeks left to make it happen. And the ask is already clear, so we made the, the yeah, we ask a letter. A letter, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm fine empowering. All right. I, I will we'll light up Todd Mom's phone, phone tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, until I get an answer for you, actually, and then get back to you with that. Perfect. And pending council's questions, I will uh, defer to the next department head. Colonel Sabori. Good evening. Good evening. So before you, uh, you should have a copy of the... February 2022 department overview, which is also available on the Centerville Police Department website. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. If you 
glance over that, uh, just an update, the prisoner transport partitions, the remaining partitions have been ordered, uh, which will allow our patrol unit fleet to be equipped with a, uh, with each vehicle to be equipped with the prisoner transport partition. So thank you for your support on that. Uh, just a quick parking update, the parking meters along Lawyers Row have been bagged out of service. We emptied all the coins out of them, bagged them out of service in preparation and anticipation for the 60 day, uh, two hour parking pilot program. Uh, we did take the operational components from those metered spaces and move them to replace non-operational parking meters throughout the town center with our priority emphasis on our kind of our business district here. Uh, and parking enforcement efforts by our uniform members uh, of the department continue. Uh, KIPP has informed me that uh, 32 hour parking signs uh, have been ordered and should arrive within 12 to 15 days. Uh, and then there's also uh, a update on the bottom of the uh, overview, department overview, that contains the uh, latest speed trailer data. So that's the uh, abridged version. Any questions? <laughs> Eric. I'm, I'll be brief. I know that's impossible to believe, but I'm going I'm to do it. Um, in all seriousness, um, is, is there a possibility that sometime between now and the end of the school year, we could do some traffic volume studies along Chesterfield so that we have some good baseline data as we anticipate traffic volumes at what's proposed at Carter Farm? We could talk offline, too, as far as how feasible that is and what the options are, but it would be nice if we had some data other than the complaints that there's a log jam there mm -hmm. during school egress. Yeah, I'd be, um, I'd be certainly open to that discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I should have mentioned when we do this meeting with the principal, I think obviously you should be there too, so we'll be happy sure to happens. join. Thank you, Chief. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Town Attorney. Uh, good evening, Will Chapman, on behalf of Sharon Van Enberg. Um, I have no new items for consideration, but I do want to clarify, uh, based on the discussion on the new water and sewer allocation, discussion of a moratorium that the council does not wish for our office to draft proposed ordinance for consideration at this time. Correct. Is that correct? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Chair, we'll look forward to that update, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> she will. <laughs> Karen, anything else? Are we, we good with your binders? Yeah, just the, the, the program for... Got to come up here, oh, okay. unfortunately. Well, that's bother. No, <laughs> even you're not that loud. I, <laughs> I just want to let you know the program for the assistance with the water wastewater bills is up and running. Um, applications can be taken on their website online. Um, I know they've had a couple glitches because we've talked to a few people, but they're working through them. So if you need assistance, go ahead and apply. Um, if you have any questions, give us a call. We'll give you the information. Are there People that you might know need assistance. I, I probably... We've called a handful that okay, we, yeah, okay, good, yeah. Good, good. Linda good, keeps good. track and we kind of go through it and, and try to see who we can reach out to Perfect. that we know would be able to qualify. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Director of Public Works. Hey. <laughs> the Resources Manager. Crystal. Good evening. Hello. Um, I'll keep it brief because um, I forgot my to-do list, but I just wanted to let sh everyone know <laughs> that um, I really don't have that many updates um, for to this evening. Um, I did attend on Tuesday uh, the career day at the Methodist Church um, along with the, the Centerville Police Department who was also in attendance. Um, it was a very good turnout. Uh, when I spoke with one of the uh, Rotary uh, representatives, um, they were worried that they would only anticipate about 10 uh, students to arrive, and there was over 40 so oh, in attendance. Great. So it was a really good turnout. Uh, I talked to a few of the students. Um, they got to, you know, lift up the pipe wrench that I brought to you know, to show some tools of the trade um, with some of our town positions. So it was really good. Um, I think it's a, a great way to, you know, even though we're a um, small number of staff, even if we don't have anything currently available for, for them specifically, it's always something uh, to help educate for in the future. 
um, because we have several employees uh, that we are currently staffed with that, and Karen, don't be timing it. <laughs> um, that we're currently staffed with where they graduated from Queen Anne's County High School, started off in you know the streets division as a utility worker, promoted all the way up, and now they're our superintendent. So I, I just think it, it really kind of helps to show these students that, yes, we have um, career ladder matrix, we have growth and development within uh, even a small you know, local government. So it was really, it was really fun to attend. Um, and uh, I was not sure if Kip was gonna mention it, but we did hire also another utility worker. Uh, they started on the 15th, um, this past Tuesday as well. So we're, you know, hopefully filling positions uh, sooner than later. Wonderful. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, did you have any questions? Not a question, but the state changed their career ladders and their degree requirements for state jobs. So I just want to say, Centerville, we were on the cutting edge. We did it first. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That is definitely a, a good thing to open up options for everyone. So thank you. That's thank all you. I have. Thank you. Appreciate it. Carolyn, town clerk. Just real quick, I have um, started. I left my list on my desk. Um, I started with the boat slips this week, so um, my favorite time of year. And um, so we only have two that are returning, two slip holders that are returning, oh, wow. and then so eight slips that are open. Um, so the two I have reached out to, one is interested. I haven't heard back from the other one. I have contacted eight people on the wait list. Um, four of them have gotten back to me. They wanted more information. I sent them, you know, cost and what I need and all that. Um, one after that contacted me and wanted the lease agreement. So we're working on that. And two, I did hear back. They're not. They're no longer interested. I can tell you this section of the. Um, wait list is from 2018 so um, I I'm assuming I'm going to get some who you know I already have a slip or whatever so I did receive two no's so I have now moved on to the next um, two people on my how long list. do we give people to get back to you before we move on um, the um, people that I sent the ones on the wait list I just said I think in previous years I gave too much information and then I didn't hear back. So it was more of a little teaser. Hey, you're on my wait list. If you're interested, let me know. I'll send you more information. Then there. So then I send it to them. And then I have been asking for them to get back to me. Um, this was yesterday. I was sending them out. So I was giving them a week to get back to me. Um, and told them. And then I'm moving on to the next people on the list. So. Um, that has been an issue in the past where I have to be harder than what I normally, I can't be mm -hmm. as nice as I normally am. And um, so I'm, I need the lease agreement, I need the payment, I need all the other stuff. And if I don't get it, I'm going on to the next person. I'm not waiting around anymore for people to give me their stuff. So that's it. For the eight people who are leaving their slips, <coughs> um, was cost a factor? No, they were done their three years. Okay. Yeah, those were the eight slips um, were done. Um, that they were at the end of their three-year lease. Okay, so, makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is our largest turnover okay. so far. Okay. Yeah, I thought so. Um, and then just one other thing: the May fifth. This is just a, a side note. The May fifth meeting. QAC TV will still be recording us, but the. Uh, county commissioners have a budget meeting in Southersville that night, which will be aired live. Ours will not be aired live, but it will go on after. So I just wanted to, I'll remind again once we get closer, but just a little programming note. Preemption. Yes. Got to make our meetings more exciting, guys. I don't know. <laughs> get that airtime. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, yes, Karen. I'm done. Okay. We will move into our second citizens forum. We'll dispense with the reading of the citizens forum. Come on up, Joe.
Joe Brown, 122 Concerto Avenue. Just real quick, um, I'm not sure if Karen answered this question or not, but is the town getting COVID funds um, from the from the federal government as part of our? We got ARPA. There's no, I don't think there's any new COVID funding from the feds coming. There's infrastructure dollars and ARPA, which but is not a, just regular unallocated. No, 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 I don't think there's any more of that left. Okay. Did we get some CARES Act? Yeah, we ha we have for sure. Mm -hmm. How much did we get? I don't know off the top of my head. Well, that's ARPA. It's ARPA. Yeah. CARES. C CARES, CARES Act. Act. CARES Act money. CARES Act. We we submitted. Uh, we actually um, got it through the county. So the county got a large portion of CARES Act money, and we were able. We basically submitted everything we spent money on related to COVID to the county, and was reimbursed for that. I can't remember off the top of my head. If you shoot me an email tomorrow, I can I I can give you that number. I'm just I can't, curious how much. Yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. So that's not part of our budget process then this year. Not this year. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The ARPA second. ARPA is which Congress does not consider COVID relief. That's the American Recovery Bill. Okay. Yeah. So we did we're getting money from that. We too. already got it. We have some more on the books. Eight hundred thousand bucks. That's got to be off of our books by twenty twenty four. The end of fiscal year twenty twenty four. Or allocated by then, spent by 26. We got 4. 4.8 million. 4.8 million we got of that. And so uh, tell me again how that got used, or is it is it for this year's budget? Uh, we we use some of it in the current fiscal year budget to for infrastructure and to begin the process of purchasing the Sprayfield Irrigation Farm, and then 800,000 of it, or, or a little bit more than that, sort of moves forward into this budget year. Okay. All right. The second um, question is, you know, Eric gave his report about the road project. And um, one of the things that we find out, uh, besides the budget overrun, is that we failed to put in the conduit or fiber optics. So what do we do to fix that situation? Because at some point, hopefully, there's going to be new vendors coming. So we're not just, you know, relying on letting broadband. So. So I actually, if I can comment first, and I, it looks like Chip might want to say something. I'm glad you said that because in the report that I mentioned, and Kip, I don't know if you are aware of this as well, but Mike Whitehill reached out to me. And when we had that opportunity where a committee came together and drafted all these options and the state was going to pay for resurfacing, um, treescapes, other, a variety of other things, and that got killed. Now that we've done what we have done, we can seek to have that same funding. And my understanding in my email back from Mike, and if anybody can verify this that's here tonight, that would be great, is that that project would allow us to have duct work placed under the sidewalks for that very purpose. So they like bore under there, is that the boring operation? Mm -hmm. Put it in there. So I, that's something that I write when I got that email literally 20 minutes before I got here this evening. And I was okay. like, uh, well, we need to talk about this well, more. Well, we know a chance we can give us some more details on it. We'll be that sound right, Kip? Anyway. I don't know if that, yeah. That's, What's the, the, project that's the again, streets? streetscapes. Am I right? That's the streetscapes program. Chip, okay. that's, that's, that's the streetscapes street. program. So one of the things you'll notice, how you doing, Joe? One of the things you'll notice with uh, Liberty Commerce is they repave the roads, and yet some of the old sidewalks are still there. And in some cases, you've only got an inch or two of curb, which isn't really enough for the stormwater runoff. Or the streetscape program, will come back and tear all that sidewalk up and that because that those pieces of roadway are state highway that they will redo those sidewalks and curbs and the idea would be if they're going to tear it all up let's put fiber underneath so that that's it's going to be a major muscle movement there'll be a lot of conversations and meetings with that joe but yes we we, we heard that and that's what eric was talking about with streetscapes earlier
is one of the vacancies. So, and they're looking at a lot of the farm lanes and the the nooks on the uh, yeah. in the water uh, areas and all that stuff. So, I'm sure that'll qualify. But it's got to go from the, from somewhere to get there. Yes, it right. sounds like it's got to come through town. But yeah, anyway, it may not stop here. Talkie did as part of the last year's budget process. Talkie asked for a half million dollar town subsidy, yeah, to defray their cost to go on the polls. Well, they've been looking at Symphony Village, and you know I'm not in the middle of that process, but it doesn't sound like it's going real smooth to me from what what I hear. So I've heard the same thing. Do we have a permit request from them? No, it hasn't got that far yet. Okay. okay. Yeah, they're just talking to our uh, our board. I see about how they're going to do it and there's a difference of opinion of how they want to do it and we have the utility areas the town you know when the town uh, put the utilities in they want to do something different so um, mm. we'll have to see how that flushes out thank you thank you joe any any other citizens wishing to make some comments all right we'll move into council roundtable council person kaiser just a couple things and one i'm going to scoop eric because i think i can do it faster but we're trying to bring first fridays back in may may 6 would be the first first fridays hoping for warm and good weather for that but eric and i have talked to some businesses about the impact of first fridays on their businesses and um, it's a mixed bag of how they feel about it but one of the concerns for a couple of the businesses is that the lack of parking turnover during first fridays makes it difficult for someone to pick up an order um so I would like to propose that the three parking spots from sort of sugar doodles to the corner away from Oshuck, so past Coliseum, if, and I'm willing to buy the signs um, myself, if we could put signs on them for 15 minute pickup parking only during that event so that there can be some parking turnover for um, those businesses there. And I think that would solve their concern. They are getting a ton of foot traffic, but we, we did have expressed to us that people are ordering, making orders and then not picking them up because they can't park, which there's tons of parking around town. So that's a level of laziness that I can't comprehend. But I do think that we could help those businesses by, you know, requiring some turnover of that parking and just some light enforcement of that. And we've, you know, already requested that there be some police presence at the event for community policing reasons, um, just to show, you know, our police force. So if we could get consensus on that, I'll order signs and, um, I won't be here May 6th, so Eric will hang them up, but we'll just make sure that there's some parking turnover for those businesses. It's fine by me. My support, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And then the one other thing was, um, I'd like to see us professionalize our election process a little bit, especially since we, for whatever reason, insist on having annual elections in town to potentially look into the cost of using electronic poll book from the County Board of Elections just to have to get rid of that handwritten sign-in sheet, which I think Carolyn would love to get rid of. <laughs> she had explored the cost in the past. The cost of using the poll book and the voting machines is huge. I don't think we need the voting machines. There's something sort of quaint about the little ballots. Yes, did you look into poll book cost? Uh, I did. It's an all or nothing. There is no, you can't just use the poll books and not the electronic ballots. So um, I talked to the county about that and it is now about $15,000. Well, that's 15. not worth it. 15. Yeah. I just, I just do think we need to. So what happens is when I um, give the county, uh, when we get done checking off and I give the county all those, that stack of paper, they enter it manually into the system and then that's what gives the voter credits and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, I did talk to them about that. It took me a while to understand. I was like, no, 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 I don't need everything. I just need the, you know, where we just check them off when they come or in. Just have to and she said, no, it's an all or nothing system because it's all through the state and they do everything. There isn't a choice to just do the check in or do the ballots. It's, okay. it's all or nothing. Well, I'd love to continue to explore that with the State Board of Elections because I know other municipalities that are larger than us do something. Um, and I, I just have concerns about the manual way we do voter check-in, just that there's just a lot of room for human error there that I would like to see not occur. Um, 
and challenging in a small town if you look at the sign-in sheet and in the staff's defense, there's also the binder where you check off a legitimate person on the voter log list. But if you were to compare that to the handwritten names, they don't match because someone's legal name might not be Joe, but they go by Joe and the town staff knows that and so they write Joe on the list and then that doesn't actually match a human being in the book. And so I just want us to make sure that our election system is professionalized in a way that every paper record that we have for it is legitimate and reflects the actual registered name of a voter, however we get at that. And I'm willing to explore that myself. Wonderful. And, and I would just add that I, I know based on everybody's political persuasion, you may or may not be for some or all of the Voter Rights Act elements at the federal level. But I think we can all share the perspective that we want our elections to be fair and to the extent that we're not breaking the bank and there's an affordable way to move into you know the current century of technology, then I, I think it's worth exploring that. Thanks for looking into it, Carolyn. I appreciate you. No problem. Yeah, it was like, you know, when you're looking at 300 to 500 people who come out to vote. That cost look, per voter is extreme. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I was like, wow. By a lot of pens and stickers I, for I, that. You know, I would have been extremely happy if we could have just used the electronic check-in, but yeah. There's got to be a way. I'll, I'll figure something <laughs> out. There's, you know, there's also the, the odds of frustratingly non-competitive elections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Where we cancel the election, which that would be a real sunk cost if you know you spent 15 right. grand and didn't even use it. Right. right. Exactly. Agreed. Councilperson Johnson. So I'd like to ask that you suspend disbelief in accepting that my intent going into this meeting was absolutely not to have anything to say during the round table. However, I did think of something. I would like to publicly thank uh, Rebecca Floor because you had said before you began to present that you wanted to be as brief as I was. And I don't think there's anyone here tonight or at home that believes that I was brief. So I just <laughs> want to say thank you and that's all I have. First man and I. Nothing to report. Vice President Keel. I, I yield job. my time back. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing? Nothing. All right. I also, hey. I also am going to yield back. Can I, before you adjourn, I have one thing. There was a, um, a support letter that I sent to everyone. I don't know if you all got a chance to see it for our mother of sorrows. So I just wanted to make sure everyone was okay with that because I do have it ready for signature. So, all right, Jeff, if you're okay, I'll sign your name. <laughs> yes, I'm good with it. Okay, Jeff, you heard it here first. Would you like to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> second, motion made and seconded. Meetings adjourned.